I'm just going to kick things off. So um, welcome everybody to um, this month's edition of the CMR Journal Club. Um, I'm Nicole Cyberlick from the University of Michigan and um, we have I think a very exciting topic today. Um, so we are going to look at a couple of papers that um, have recently come out looking at CEST, so chemical exchange saturation transfer contrast for um, cardiac MR. And um, part of the reason I think this is very interesting is because, you know, again, we typically deal with, um, you know, I would say more traditional contrast weightings like T1 and T2 weighting, and we, you know, are well aware of um, LGE and things that we can, you know, um, generate through the application of um, exogenous contrast agents. But there are like this whole burgeoning field of new kinds of contrasts that um, may be very useful to looking at uh, dis different aspects of um, you know, either cardiac tissue or metabolism. And, um, and so CEST is one of those that's recently come up. Um, so we have two presenters today. Um, the first um, paper will be presented by Dr. Moriel Vansberger, um, and that is um, Individually tailored spatial spectral pulse cest MRI for ratiometric mapping of myocardial energetic species at 3T. And then um, our second paper is, will be presented by um, Dr. Xiao Li. And this paper is entitled Non Enhanced Chemical Exchange Saturation Transfer Cardiac Magnetic Resonance Imaging in Patients with Amyloid Light Chain Amyloidosis. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to hand over to Dr. Vansberger at this point um, to take a look at his paper. As usual, um, if you have any questions, you can drop them into the chat or save them to ask yourself um, as soon as our presenter is finished. Yep. Go ahead, Maury, I'll take it away. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, so um, I'm going to have a very, very quick version of CEST as I start to look through this paper. Um, so this paper doesn't give uh, much background on CEST. It's really about methodological improvements and accidental findings. So at some point, I'll probably present a more formal seminar on how CEST works. But the way to think about CEST is um, CEST is kind of the everything, everywhere, all at once approach. So inside of our tissues, we have metabolic subspecies like creatine and phosphocreatine that have uh, protons in amine uh, functional groups that exist at um, specific resonant frequencies that are different from water. They can absorb RF energy. We can saturate the magnetic moment. That magnetic moment undergoes chemical exchange with surrounding water. And essentially, the water becomes this gigantic amplifier for this molecular signal. We also have a lot of amide protons. Um, which resonate at 3.6 ppm that are found in most of the large macromolecules and soluble proteins within our cells. I'll talk mostly about cardiomyocytes today. Um, and that tells us a lot about hypertrophic processes, remodeling. You see in cancer, very high contrast generated by APT because you're doubling the amount of intracellular protein every time. And so those amides, which is just the N attached to the H, um, generate a substantial amount of contrast. And that's really what you're going to be seeing in the second paper in this presentation, which is um, heightened amide proton transfer contrast uh, in amyloids. Um, then you also have the endogenous exchange between the extracellular matrix and the surrounding water, which because of the very large number of macromolecules and fast tumbling rates is spread out. And we know this as magnetization transfer. And then we also have another contrast called nuclear overhauser effect, which some of you may be familiar with from when you did NMR. Uh, biochemistry in undergrad. Um, that has actually two peaks at the negative offset. And so inside of all of our tissues, we're actually generating all of these contrasts. And the thing is that the concentrations of the metabolites or the proteins are on the millimolar level, which is great because it's detectable, um, but it's not on the effect of what you tend to see with gadolinium. So it's endogenous and, and it's very sensitive, not in terms of detecting small quantities, but in terms of the experimental parameters. And one of the things that we discovered in my group was that when we went from looking at cest in the heart at 1.5 T to cest in the heart at 3 T, small changes in B1 across the tissue generated really divergent patterns. So for example, just looking at creatine cest contrast, um, which has been used to look at the health of myocardial tissue, because we know that in, in the failing heart, we have a downregulation of the expression of the proteins that are involved in the creatine kinase cascade and cardiac metabolism, what we observed was that between the septum and the inferior wall, simple differences in B1 and transmit B1 of about 20% at 3T would make healthy people look like they had no creatine indicative of a heart attack or myocardial infarction. And we knew that wasn't true. I'm not that cruel to my graduate students yet. 
Right. And so um, we started on this project really working with Will Grissom, who at the time was at Vanderbilt and now is at Case, on basically using some of his tailored spectral spatial excitation pulses to create a more uniform B1 field. And that was the rationale. What we wanted to do was perform multispectral cest imaging, look at all these different targets in the heart, quantify everything, but we really needed uniform B1. And I want to emphasize how, how much this really matters, and it matters because cest is kind of like the microwave burrito problem. The contrast that you get out is innately a function of the power you put in and the concentration of the metabolites that you're trying to image. So just like anyone here who was a kid in the 80s and 90s and ate microwave burritos when they got home from school knows, when you put the burrito in the microwave, the outside was burning hot, the middle was just right, and the inside was still frozen. And so cest is no different than that. And so what you need is really a more uniform excitation process. So working with Will, we were able to do this where we read in a B1 map from each patient and generated an individualized spectral spatial excitation pulse that would be used for cest imaging. <clears throat> so some of the examples of the simulation data are shown here in figure two. And what we're able to observe was that in theory, we should have been able to generate and we were able to generate much more uniform uh, uh, B1 uh, fields for cest uh, preparation, which meant that the contrast that was being generated across the myocardium was much more uniform uh, for a given concentration of uh, creatine or APT, etc. Um, <clears throat> the the image that you all saw at the start um, of the kind of the intro slide really shows the ability to generate more uniform data, and and where this comes in. Um, in a way that's really important is kind of on these interfaces. So the top graph here shows the maps of cest contrast expressed as a value, which is derived from the amplitude of the Lorentzian fit data. And I, I'll explain that when I come visit you. Yeah. Um, and what you can see is that there's a lot of artifact, for example, really bright values around the, the um, endocardial wall in this area, very low values here in the inferior lateral wall. <clears throat> Um, particularly for creatine, and a lot of this had to do with B1 and homogeneities. Um, and then using the spectral spatial subpulse, the first thing that we noticed was particularly for the intermediate exchanging protons, we were able to get much more uniform cest contrast um, for each of these pools. Um, the way that we can really appreciate this is by looking at what's called a Z spectrum. So each dot along this axis represents an individual image, and then the mean signal intensity from that image normalized to a reference. And I want to just orientate everyone very quickly. This dip from what should be just a normal Lorentzian here is caused by creatine subspecies. This dip here is caused by APT, that intracellular protein. And then we, we undersampled for purposes of time this side because we weren't really interested in NOE. And what you can observe is that using just kind of an off-the-shelf B1 uh, you know, Gaussian excitation pulse for cess preparation, you see a pretty big difference in the Z spectrum from one side of the heart to the other. And this is really indicative of variable power. By using the spectral spatial, um, the individually tailored spectral spatial pulses, we're able to get much more uniform data across the heart. But we noticed something else, which was that while the use of this spectral spatial subpulse resulted in more enhanced B1 fields, um, and so tighter distributions of apparent values for many of the different you know, pools we were looking for, we observed a substantial decrease in the contrast from creatine. And you can really appreciate this by looking at this region of the curve between 2 and 3 ppm. Um, and by really zooming in, and what you need to know is that there's actually um, two pools or three pools of contrast really in uh, metabolites in the heart. There's creatine at 1.8 ppm and phosphocreatine at 2.4 and 2.8 ppm. And what was really interesting was my student, Cindy, who's the first author of this paper, did something really smart. She went back and used something called isotemp or pure temp, one of the two, to keep phantoms at 37 degrees because it turns out nobody had actually done phantom work at body temperature. Um, and all of the data on imaging of creatine in the heart with cest had been done at room temperature. And at room temperature, the exchange rate of creatine becomes nicely intermediate, and the exchange rate of phosphocreatine becomes too slow to generate any kind of reasonable contrast. Whereas what we observed at body temperature was that 
um, using spectral spatial excitation, we were actually essentially filtering out the contribution of creatine to our contrast. And we were um, uh, able to get contrast from phosphocreatine only, which means that now we had a method to look at total creatine contrast, phosphocreatine and creatine, and just phosphocreatine contrast. And that enabled us to then go back and look at the ratio of phosphocreatine to total creatine based on these amplitudes that we were able to fit. And so that phosphocreatine to total creatine mapping is very slow here, but it's something that we're working on doing in a much more accelerated fashion right now. So I think that's my 10 minutes. Perfect. Yes, that was exactly your 10 minutes. Great job. Um, all right. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open um, this paper up for questions from the audience. Um, and usually people are a little shy at first, but so maybe I can get started. Um, so, you know, you talked about how you used individually tailored B or individually acquired T1 maps to tailor your pulses. So how long did that process take? Like it clearly was still happening while the subject was in the scanner. So is this something that, you know, can be done on the fly very quickly or, um, you know, is it kind of a pain to re-inject that <laughs> pulse? So um, uh, let's say my grad student runs very fast. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's a little bit of a pain, which is actually one of the things that we're looking at getting rid of now that we're acquiring clinical data on this. Um, but really, so what, what we would do is we would acquire the B1 map before we would acquire any of the just kind of standard images. And then, you know, for this study, we were acquiring 40 odd cessed weighted images to complete a Z spectrum. So the five minutes that it took to process the B1 map, generate a tailored pulse, write it to a text file, copy it to the right place on the scanner was irrelevant. Um, when we're doing this in the clinic, this is much more problematic. And so what we've been doing is having the techs acquire the B1 map as soon as they find the slice that they're looking for. Um, and then we're able to get it loaded on there in the like five second, you know, they give us like two minutes between the end of their acquisition and when they press the go button on the gadolinium injection. So we're able to get it loaded up now in place while the, the normal cest data is being acquired. So. Um, but it's it's a dance, you know, because especially with the new system Siemens has, it's not trivial to get an external drive connected to a computer. So, got it. Okay, so it's still kind of a work in progress to, yeah. to get that streamlined. Um, so there's a question from Dr. Venk Murthy. Um, he's asking about the gold standard for the human study. So I, I assume you mean for the like the more quantitative measurements. Thank so you. that's tricky, right? So it's this is a problem. Uh, you're, you're highlighting a problem that we're trying to figure out too, which is the gold standard is colometric assay. And to date, none of my students have been willing to let me biopsy their endocardium. So um, it's, it's a little challenging. Um, what we're doing as a true gold standard measurement is we're doing a lot of this in preclinical models, um, uh, including moving mice down to 3T. Um, on a, we're collaborating with someone who has a tabletop 3T system. Um, we're also working with folks at Stanford who have um, heart transplant rejection um, or ex explanted hearts. So we're able to do a lot more validation there. Um, some people have asked like, why don't we just do validation with spectroscopy? Um, I think everyone who's worked with P31 spectroscopy understands the limitations of P31 spectroscopy. Um, and in addition to that, you know, P31 spectroscopy gives you a measurement of phosphocreatine to ATP, not phosphocreatine to total creatine. Or, so if you want free creatine, you have to use proton NMR. Um, and it's the, it's just a little bit too complicated, frankly, to do all of those things in a way where you're really making an apples to apples comparison. The other thing that I'd like to point out is, you know, cest contrast is a semi-quantitative measure right now. You know, if I were to tell you, uh, I don't know if anyone on this call, I know Simon's a cardiologist, but I don't know if anybody else is, right? If I were to go to Simon and I were to say, Simon, this patient's cest contrast for creatine is 3% and I'm 6%, what should we do with this patient? He would say, I have no idea, right? It's a meaningless value right now. So one of the things that we're actually working on in my group is, um, we're doing a lot of preclinical harvesting um, in order to basically create, you know, in a neural network model that allows us to convert cest contrast to the values you'd get from colometric assays or from RT-PCR data. Um, so uh, turning this from 
from contrast, right? Which doesn't have a value to something that's like what you get out of an ELISA. Um, and of course that's taking time, so. Awesome, perfect. Okay, I'm sure Moriel can answer any other questions you might have if you wanna drop them in the chat, but we are now going to move to our second presenter, Dr. Lee, um, in order to take a look at um, what we might be able to do with our contrast. Can you hear me? Versus contrast clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Can you. Okay. Yes, perfect. All right, so you can go ahead and share your screen. I can share myself. Yes. And do it by myself. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, hello, my name is Li Xiao from Peking Union Medical College Hospital, Beijing, China. And this is my honor to be here. The only thing I have to say that the only thing that I'm worried about is the language. So I myself prefer Q&A by emails, but it's okay. I will try my best. And uh, this work is about non-enhanced CES CMI in patients with amyloid light chain amyloidosis. The background is that uh, the heart is one of the most commonly involved organ in this patient population. So of course, it's a very important topic. And CMI, we are familiar with that. A typical pattern of extensive, predominantly subendocardial LGE is a diagnostic clue for this uh, for cardiac involvement and is also a prognostic marker for mortality. And same is uh, T1 mapping and ECV. However, none of these parameters reflect, reflect myocardial metabolism directly. And the CK system plays a vital role in the synthesis of ATP. Thus, measurement of creatine can serve as a biomarker to investigate the metabolic changes in the myocardium. Previous studies have done this by spectroscopy, but with a small patient cohorts with controversial results and limited clinical applications. And this time we use CES, this technique. And this is provided by Professor W. Li and his team. They developed this sequence and the, uh, the power sequence diagram of the proposed technique is showed here. Uh, actually, I myself not familiar with this uh, physical part. <laughs> I'm a doctor. <laughs> and their, pre their previous study have uh, uh, showed, uh, have validated uh, in an uh, animal model and in patients with chronic myocardial infection. We, this time we just uh, take and use it in AL amyloidosis patients. Uh, this prospective study, we have 52 patients with at baseline with uh, newly diagnosed by BSP and RC29 healthy control. All patients underwent enhanced MI, and but the healthy controls underwent contrast free uh, MI for different reasons. Uh, the scan was done using uh, uh, SCARA Simons. We have seen the images, uh, T1 mapping, T2 mapping, LGE, of course, and uh, the contrast-free, uh, contrast-free free-breathing navigated cyst were acquired before contrast injection in a single basal LV short axis slice. The scan time was about five minutes with a navigated efficiency of around uh, 30%. It's uh, clinically acceptable. Uh, particularly, uh, LGE images uh, were grouped into three groups, uh, non-LGE, which means uh, the involvement, involvement of the heart is non or very, very mild, and the patch LGE, which means that it's moderately involved, and the global LGE, the disease burden is very severe. The analysis of uh, CES map was done also by Professor Lee's team. Uh, we have three examples. This is patient A, patient B, patient C, and they are assessed the map, LGE images, and the ECV match. Patient A is a patient uh, clinically almost normal. You can see that the global cyst is uh, of uh, 0 0.14. It's a normal value. And uh, negative LGE and a global ECV value of 20, 70% is almost novel. So this is our most novel patient. Uh, 
And the second patient, uh, he has a decreased cyst of 0 0.10, uh, 0 0.110, uh, one zero, and the patch LD here. And the increased the group ECV of 46%. And the third patient is the most uh, severe patient. He has a decreased uh, global cess of 0 0.07 and the extensive edge displays and the global ECV of 50%. And the region with decreased cess value in red color matches the region of positive LGE and the region with uh, uh, increased ECV. And uh, the results section, we just uh, look at the uh, tables. Table one shows the clinical and the CMR characteristics in patients and the controls. Finally, we have 20 controls and uh, 40 patients. The patients are older. And for the MR parameters, uh, the patient has uh, uh, decreased LVEF, increased LV mass, decreased uh, RVEF, and uh, increased, uh, increased LV mass, decreased LV strain, and uh, increased uh, nativity one, nativity two, and uh, decreased the cest. So we can see the difference. And table two shows the correlation between the cest signal, uh, normally used the clinical characteristics and the other MR parameters in the healthy control. We can see that neither global cest or septal cest are correlated significantly with these parameters. And uh, table three shows the correlation between cess signal with clinical stage and MR parameters in patients. We okay, see that uh, global cess correlated with uh, with male stage. These two are clinical stage, uh, male stage, NYHA class, uh, LVEF, LV mass, string, LGE, native T1, ECV, and T2. Uh, particularly, we take a look at uh, LGE subgroups. We see that as the area of LGE increased, the value of cess decreased. We could see the change. And the table four and the table five, we just skip it. So in this study, we showed the feasibility of cess MI to identify cardiac involvement and evaluate disease burden in this patient cohort. Further, we access the correlation of cess signal with other MR parameters to explore the interaction between metabolic changes with the structural and the functional changes in the course of this patient. We found that cess signal was decreased in patients compared to the control and uh, it created significantly with the clinical stage LG pattern and ECV. Uh, none of age or uh, other MR parameters uh, uh, co correlated significantly with cysts in healthy controls, suggesting that they are not, uh, cysts are not in influenced by these parameters. Uh, okay. Besides the risk, uh, we, post, we proposed that the cess could be an uh, intermediary readout between structure and function. We found that the cess signal every mass and uh, these other parameters were correlated moderately, indicating, indicating that none of them alone could reflect the whole picture of the disease. So taking advantage of conscious free, uh, cess may add to the value of MI as a one-stop comprehensive evaluation approach. Uh, we have some limitations, of course. The first, there is a lack of uh, a reference standard like uh, biopsy, same with the first presentation. And the second, the patient numbers were low and from single center. Third, the technique needs further improvement as the acquisition duration is, uh, was long and only 70% of cases were analyzable in this study. That's part of it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for presenting this really interesting paper. Um, so I'm gonna open it up now to questions from the group. Um, so again, yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself. I do have yourself. a question. Oh yes, um, go ahead, it's, please. Yeah, it's it, great work. It's fascinating that you can um, uh, uh, identify area of involvement with our contrast. Have you tried, I mean, first of all, do you think this is 
AL amyloidosis unique, or you think there's a potential to apply to uh, AATTR a uh, subtype as well? Uh, actually, this patient cohort is the, the largest patient cohort we have this time. And the ATTR amyloidosis actually is very, is very rare in China. Oh, really? Oh. Uh, yeah. We only have 10 patients uh, during 10 years. Wow. I think in, in the States, it's the opposite. We see more ATTR subtype. So you have no experience. Uh, uh, with yeah, yeah. Uh, ATTR, yeah. but do you, uh, do you, would you uh, postulate that this may have the same potential for ATTR subtype as well? Is I there any so. reason I not think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. Thank you. I think the same way goes to LGE and the ECV. Right, right. Great, great work. Thank you. All right. Do we have any other questions? Perhaps I can ask a question. So um, I know in our group, you know, when we're looking at um, potential non-contrast mechanisms and matching those to LGE, we have a difficult time deciding, you know, how exactly to draw our regions of interest. And so can you describe, so, you know, you have this global SAS value and then you have a septal SAS value. Can you describe how you drew the ROIs and whether you used the LGE images to help inform those ROIs or whether they were just completely independent? Uh, the analysis of says the map was done not by me myself, it's done by Professor De Valley. I It's not my work. And uh, ECV map, we, have, uh, we are done by uh, a software called CDI. I think this is a uh, clinically well used software. We just uh, uh, control the end and uh, at echo of the endo and epicardium. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, I can show you the image by email. That, that would be great. <laughs> All right, anybody else with any questions for Dr. Lee? All right, in that case, I think we'll wrap up. We're actually on time today, which almost never happens to us. Um, yeah, again, I think this was a really an excellent, um, you know, kind of viewpoint of looking at different kinds of contrast and where we might be able to explore um, applications clinically. So I really appreciate our speakers. Um, I would like to say that um, the ISMRM is coming up and I hope to see many of you there. If you are there and you see something interesting that you would like to um, see presented at the Journal Club, please send me an email, um, either me or Matthias. We're happy to take suggestions from all of you um, because you're going to be able to see a lot more than um, the two of us will by ourselves. Um, usually Matthias would have next month's Journal Club, but I am taking over for June 5th and our plan is to talk about um, T1 mapping and reproducibility. Um, so this is actually a topic that I am quite interested in and um, you know, we're going to look at how reproducible the techniques are now and whether there are ways to normalize the values so that we could potentially compare them across vendors and institutions. So if you're interested in T1 mapping, put June 5th on your calendar and I will see you there. Um, and again, if, if we run into each other at, at ISMRM, it would be great to see you. So do say hello. So with that, we'll wrap it up and have a um, good travels to everybody traveling and a great week um, to everybody on the call. Thank you. Bye.